roughly, I have had 30 different companies. Two of them have been wildly successful. Another eight have been really good. And the other 20 were ones I had to throw out. You learn 10 times more from your losses than you do your wins. Hey friends, this is Podcast Ruined by Software Engineer. Hi, I'm Perry and on this episode I get to talk to Steve Taplin, CEO of Sonotify, a software development company leveraging the talent of nearshore software developers. If you enjoy Podcast Ruined by Software Engineer, don't forget to hit the follow button on your podcast app so you don't miss out on the new episodes. And you can pick up podcast merch at parrotsu.com slash shop. Enjoy the episode. Welcome back to another episode of Podcast Room by Software Engineer. I'm your host, Perry, and today with me is Steve Taplin, CEO of Sonotify. Steve, how are you today? Perry, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on your podcast. And thank you for being on the show, mostly because this is a topic that I absolutely love to dig into. There's so many terms that you deal with every day, like tech turn CEOs, but also nearshore versus offshore software development. These are all terms that me personally, as a geek, Perry, I love talking about this. But maybe if, you know, I can do justice in terms of describing you, maybe to help people out, 30 seconds, who is Steve and what is Sonotify? Absolutely. Um, so I am a serial entrepreneur that has been a serial tech entrepreneur throughout my career. I've also had some few stints at large Fortune 500 tech companies. And I have a passion for helping businesses succeed. And to me, the ability to build custom applications in order to create a custom experience for your end users to differentiate yourself as a business is the biggest way I know how to succeed. And that's why I uh, I am CEO and co-founder of Sonotify Technology. Uh, we are a nearshore software development company. We're headquartered in Scottsdale, Arizona. We have 140 senior level full-time engineers that are physically located throughout Latin America with 80% of our team throughout Mexico. All our senior uh, cloud and mobile-based engineers that are fully bilingual, that are natively in US time zones, and we provide software development services typically to US-based clients that that same time zone support is key for them. Even the brief description, one thing that I actually like you were saying, like serial entrepreneur, but also the fact that what you do is is scalable. I hate throwing this word out there without justifying what I mean. What I mean is that you're not helping one company, you're not helping two companies, you're helping literally probably infinitely many companies. Um, one thing I do want to dive into is the maybe the bit of the background behind Steve, right? Like, was Steve always like this? Did you wake up as a kid one day be like, I will build 50 million businesses and make them all successful? I feel like that's always a story that we sometimes ask ourselves. Where did you grow up? What did your environment look like? I am um, originally from the Chicagoland area, the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, and, and I grew up what I would call upper middle class. Um, my father was always in technology and IT. And kind of one of the turning points for in his career was when he moved, he used to run data center operations, and then he moved into technology sales. And when he did that, it really changed um, our family's life and opened up additional uh, income opportunities that uh, we were fortunate to be afforded to. Um, I, growing up, I, I kind of always knew I wanted to be... Um, on the business side of the fence. Uh, I knew being a doctor wasn't for me or uh, business always um, interests me and, and I was always interested in technology. And that's what led me to get my undergrad degree from Northern Illinois University in management information systems, which now I'm dating myself because that was, back then that was the blend between a business degree and a computer science degree um, through, through the business school. And I started my career at this little company called IBM. Um, at the time, um, this was in 1997, the internet was kind of just being born at that point. And I had the privilege of working out of IBM's first, what was referred to at the time, e-business hosting data center, which was actually out of Schaumburg, Illinois, which was cl uh, close to where I lived. And so this was when internet e-commerce started to take off. It was initially referred to as e-business hosting, and now it's just affectionately known as the cloud. 
Um, but I got to be in that environment when it was new, when it was the hottest thing. And I got to, um, I started off actually as a project manager kind of on the data center floor and got to see um, the challenges of dealing with high internet traffic, of the security around uh, at the time doing e-commerce type transactions on the internet was new and um, was also really at the advantage because people who have been around data center environments prior to that, it was mainframes and older technology. And so I, I wasn't behind anyone. If anything, I was ahead of it, everyone of what I was learning because it was new at the time. And um, that led me to go into sales at IBM of this particular niche of this e-business data center uh, outsourcing. And I, I had a, a great run and I, by age 24, by being at the right place and right time, uh, I became one of the top salespeople at IBM. And um, having that success early also helped me realize that the corporate world was not for me, that being an entrepreneur was what I needed to do to reach my goals. And I didn't know that. Uh, before going into that, um, just because my family was not entrepreneurs and I was not around it, I didn't realize that that's where my passion was. And while I was at IBM, I got my MBA uh, from DePaul University in Chicago, and my MBA was in entrepreneurship, which at the time, and this was in two, early uh, 2000s, um, an MBA or an entrepreneurship focus was very rare. And it was a weird thing because I had a couple of years working experience after my undergrad. Um, I always did good in college. I was a solid B student, but I, I never enjoyed the learning from the sense that what can I use to help me be successful? I mean, you're, when you learn from professors who've never been in the real world, you're learning one thing. And my entrepreneurship classes as part of my MBA was the first time in my educational career that I actually enjoyed it. I'm like, this is stuff I can see and this is how I can make money and this is how I could put it to use. And it was the first time I enjoyed like the, the college education experience. And so that's where an, I knew that that's where my passion was at. I actually... Um, as part of my MBA in entrepreneurship, I became a published author of entrepreneurship um, around serial entrepreneurs, which serial entrepreneurs are ones that have a passion for the startup phases to business and are great at taking to a certain point, but then get bored with it and sell it off to other type entrepreneurs and like that startup phase through a certain phase of growth. And so that's where I found my passion and um, I knew what I wanted to do with my career. A lot of what you shared right now is so interesting. Maybe there's a couple of points. I just want to reel back just so I, because I have this mindset as well, where it's like you enjoy what you learn when you're in a different mindset. Like when you went into your MBA, you definitely had a different mindset than when you had to do like your bachelor's and you were kind of forced in this like GPA system and all that. But I believe maybe high level the MBA was maybe like pass fail like you also took like a break I'm assuming between uh, the end of your bachelor's and the beginning of that MBA what did your mindset look like during that process like, I feel like that's a big impact because a lot of people that comes out of these bachelor degrees and then they do a they work in a private sector they always ask themselves should I go back to MBA so maybe you could share a bit what happened then I absolutely think that if you're a business major you should work in the real world for a couple years prior to going back for your MBA because it gives you a, or, or graduate degree, it gives you a much different perspective that when you're uh, a young college student that hasn't been in the professional world in the career you've chosen, um, it gives you a whole different perspective. And so that actually was a big changer for me and I'm glad I did it that way. And um, look, we don't. We all don't know what we don't know, and getting that real world experience before going back for an advanced degree, uh, to me, was was much more useful. No, absolutely. Next time I, I talk to you, I'll be enrolled in an MBA program at X Y Z, and uh, I'll be yeah. That's because of Steve. <laughs> hey, I and you know I did it 
Um, and what propelled me to do it was I started having great success in the or in the corporate world, and I wanted more. I, I I wanted to make sure I'm doing everything I can to continue that, and that's what drove me to do it. Um, and of course, the tech podcast. I can't take I can't miss the opportunity to ask you like when's the first time you touched a computer or used the computer? You know, those kind of like really day-to-day -day moments where you don't really realize it's a life-changing fact, but maybe from your perspective, you and technology growing up, what was the first time to come? Maybe like it was a smart TV from way back then that you had. Like, what was that like first interaction like to be like, this is amazing, this is cool? Man, Perry, and I'm definitely a lot older than you by that comment. But when I was in high school, to put it in perspective, I had, there was the option to take a typing class on a typewriter. Um, so this was pre-computer and the only reason I took the class is because, um, it was all very good looking girls that were taking that class. And I'm like, I'm there. And all of a sudden, like I was able to pick up typing really quick and, um, the ability to type. And, um, that's kind of what propelled me into my interest in computers and technology because, you know, the keyboard is uh, your steering wheel to technology. And so that was uh, how I reverse got into it. Um, and when the first internet that came out that I can recall was America Online, AOL. And there were these things called chat rooms that were obviously everybody in the world in 2024 knows what that uh, chat rooms are now, social media and other forums. But it was so new then, and I almost thought it was like a joke. And like, I was, you know, a teenage kid, and I'm going in these chat rooms and like messing around. And like, it didn't even dawn on me that they're real people, because I almost thought of it as a game. And I actually, my dad got kicked. He got his subscription to AOL revoked because of me. And I was like, oh my gosh. And we had to get a new subscription to it under my mom's name. And uh, that's how, but I'm definitely aging myself as I'm uh, 49 years old. Um, and kind of uh, my intro into computers and the internet world. No, trust me. Everything that you mentioned, like people of the show know that, you know, Perry loves talking about this stuff, like the 56K modems and all like the, the Commodore 64s and everything back then. Those are all like absolutely great. And the fact that the way you describe it to be like everything that you dealt with back then feels like new, but also, also a lot of people nowadays, when we use technology, we have the same sentiment. There's just always perpetuality of people just dealing with new technology, like fiber optics, sure. It's freaking cool. You get like two gigs of download speed all the time. For us, it's kind of a little bit of the, the same uh, approach nowadays today. And I really like the, the typewriter story just because nowadays, I feel like, I don't know if you read some of these headlines, sen sensation headlines, to be like, the younger generation, the younger people of our, our current times right now, they can't, they're not as great on the keyboard. They're not as great as typing just because they're always on their phone and everything. And you see this like kind of this cycle, right? To be like, it wasn't that crazy to learn how to type back then. Uh, my geek question would be, was it still QWERTY? Was it like the Q-W-E-R-T keyboard or was it a different type of typewriter that you were dealing with back then? To my knowledge, the layout of a keyboard has not changed throughout my life. One thing I do want to ask everybody, this is really people geeking out, is did you ever have the chance to 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 learn how to do like very basic, basic, basic programming? Because I share the story for myself that, of course, I do software engineering and, and stuff nowadays. But was I, was I when was the first time I looked at it? Was it intentional? And for me, it wasn't. It was something in high school where there was this one two hour session. I remember it was like there was this person who just subbed in and he was like, well, I'll show you how to make a website to the whole class. And nobody really asked for it. And all he did, he opened a TXT file put in a couple of HTML tags in it, and he just dragged and dropped it inside of a browser. And then next thing you know, we, we were just like, that's the internet, that's a web page. So my encounter for these kind of stuff was unasked for. It was never, never thing. So maybe for you, was there any moments like that where you were just exposed to maybe a bit of coding or a bit of like programming throughout your life, whether intentional or not? So when I was in college and I graduated my undergrad in 1997, to put it in perspective for the viewer, and when you were graduating, and I had a business slash computer science degree, the hottest programming language to learn at that time, and anybody who is uh, younger than me probably won't understand, but it was COBOL. COBOL is an old mainframe programming language that is still around today, but there was this concern that every big computer system, mainframe system in the world, when it hit year 2000, was going to crash because... 
it, uh, the date was not programmed into programs to account for uh, the year changing to that. And so where you could make the most money coming out of college at the, in the late 90s, mid to late 90s, was COBOL programming because they were, every major corporation was fighting that fight of not sure if the, the computer world will end. Uh, it never ended. Um, but I will say that I had found and I had like two COBOL programming classes in college. And I did realize early, I'm not the guy to program it, but I need to understand how programming works. And so I can be a leader in that space. And so I've never been a, a hands to keyboard programmer, but I've taken the time to learn and understand it so that I can be effective at what I do. I like the fact that you're saying that, like, if you don't experience yourself from, like, probably the front line level, it's really hard to really understand, like, writing this line of COBOL is a pain in the butt, just because I've, I've written a little bit of COBOL for the fun of it, not professionally, but in the sense of, like, it's really... For the it's, fun it's, of it, then, we probably have to have a separate conversation, because that's not normal. <laughs> well, hey, now you know more about Perry. <laughs> But it was, it was definitely something in the sense of the perspective of the Y2K. I do have to just guess on the show that I have spoken about it. And it does make an impact in terms of your landscape, even in, in 2024. Like, we have our own little issues going on. But also, back then, it was so interesting to see what technology and your exposure to it. But of course, it led you down a path of more like, I know what you could do with the technology, what you want to do with it. And you threw out these terms of sales engineering or like... Sorry, sales. Sales engineering, I don't know if it's exactly the same vein that we're talking about, but sales, but then in the space of engineering, the space of tech and all that, and especially the part where it's like the cloud. People assume it exists. People assume it popped out of thin air, which technically in physics, like clouds do pop out of thin air, but there's a lot of infra that led you, not you, but led the technology to that point. So maybe this is the part where it gets interesting, because we're going to talk about Sonatify, but how you got to Sonatify for that is that you spent a little bit of time, of course, working at IBM, nearly a decade, if I got that correctly, but also at another role, also at an equity firm. So I want to just maybe dive into your little brain in terms of how sales and technology kind of mesh together. Um, maybe in the role of transitioning from project management to sales when you're at IBM, which quality did you bring with you to sales from somebody who was working in tech, whether it's a product manager, product specialist, what skills was the most relevant for you to be able to bring you into that more sales space in the tech field? So one of the things that my father experienced and why he had so much success when he went into sales later in his career is because he did understand the technology. He was running data centers and that made him all that more effective. And he had coached and mentored me that I need to make sure to get some of that hands-on experience because in sales, there's two types of salespeople. Um, there are ones that truly understand it and have a passion for helping people and others who are faking it massively. And anyone, any high level smart tech person knows very quickly if you're talking with a salesperson who truly knows what they're talking about. And so I did that route so that I uh, take my mentor, my father's advice to get that experience of doing it. And I got pretty lucky because even though I only did that for a year, it was a year on steroids uh, because it was not only new for me, but it was new for everybody. And so um, luck happens when pr preparation and opportunity meet. I became a top salesperson at IBM at a very young age. I was at the right place, the right time. And I got to the very few people, um, you know, IBM at the time probably had 350,000 employees. And there were like a group of maybe a hundred of us on that data center floor in that building, maybe a couple hundred that were directly involved in that and the challenges of it. And the, the first, website I could think of that was a big project. It was Victoria's Secret. And Victoria's Secret were one of the first pioneers into the e-commerce market. And they were gearing up for a big Super Bowl commercial to promote that you could buy Victoria's Secret items online. And the company at the time predicted that, you know, they would get X amount of traffic and they got probably a thousand times what their projection was. And this was, um, this was the beginning center 
or the beginning days of data center outsourcing of cloud. Now you have these scalable environments that you could scale up and scale down. That's not how it was when it started. And um, the website did go down because there was probably in the solution was probably built in for five to 10 X of what they thought the amount of traffic would be. And it was like a thousand X of what they thought. And it was a great learning experience. And, you know, the cloud and those of us who have been in the data center outsourcing industry for a long time, all the cloud means is is somebody else's uh, data center and somebody else's servers that um, you're using. Um, And it's, uh, so it's, I, I, right place, right time to experience some unique things to get my perspective on it. No, absolutely. Experience it firsthand <laughs> when you're in the midst of the fire of the storm to be like, how do we resolve this? Who's solving this? That's, that definitely marks you and I can hear it from, from the way you described the story. Um, and one thing that was actually interesting is two, three years ago, whether that Coinbase, I think they had a, a Super Bowl ad and then like it was a QR code and just completely crashed the servers. That was another fun one uh, to think about that. It's a problem that has repeated itself over the years and even decades of all of this. Um, maybe I should ask th- I should have asked this question earlier, but what were you selling? I know we're talking about data center. I'm talking about that kind of stuff. But maybe from like a layman from point of view is that, hey, you're a salesperson for IBM. Nowadays, you could be like, there are salespeople that sells IBM laptops. There's salespeople that sells like IBM physical hardware servers and all that. But maybe from your perspective as a, as a quick, like explain like I'm five kind of thing, what was Steve selling for IBM back then? I was a specialist around this e-business center outsourcing. So large companies who wanted to take advantage of the internet and once again, any e-commerce was one of the first big internet ventures that um, to kick off doing business over the internet outside of just informational. So I was a specialist for IBM in that area for this area of outsourcing. Which isn't that completely dissimilar to what you do today, to be fair, in the sense of building these technology and these platform and these software. So... But to get to that point, you did do the sales role for for a while, but what was the chapter after then? As I decided the entrepreneurial world was for me, um, I, outside of my family, um, my passions were technology and real estate investment. And I started building real estate investment companies that I would build software to operate the company in a manner to maximize operations. And I, then I started building marketing companies because I wasn't happy with the marketing companies that were helping me. And then I continued to start building a portfolio of companies, which is actually what led to me creating my own private equity firm. Um, that was a firm that all we did was start, run, operate, and sell businesses. And um, that uh, I had a portfolio of a lot of different companies uh, from software development companies to search engine optimization and marketing companies to real estate investment, construction, mortgage companies. Um, I had and my premise for every company was how do I build custom software to make the company operate more efficiently um, so I can grow sales really quick. And my business model was grow it quick and sell it. Or if it's a dud, put it out to pasture and move on to the next. Yeah, knowing when to cut your losses. I mean, I don't want to emphasize that part, but I feel like that's also a super important part of the equation of everything that you're dealing with. It's, it's definitely a key concept to understand. I will, and I like to tell entrepreneurs this or people who want to be entrepreneurs. Um, roughly, I have had 30 different companies throughout my career. Uh, Two of them have been wildly successful. Another eight have been really good. And the other 20 were ones I had to throw out. Um, And that's part of being an entrepreneur. And uh, I tried to take one of my companies public in 2014. And I missed. Um, But those from your, your, you learn 10 times more from your losses than you do your wins, um, undisputedly. And, um, one of i think the biggest qualities to be a successful entrepreneur is you got to be able to get kicked down you got to you got to lose you got to be able to start over um and keep that enthusiasm going and anybody who's known me throughout my career has always more than my successes they've admired how 
I can have a business fail and move on and move to the next. Um, and, th and that's just something you have to do. And anyone who, uh, who says they've uh, been a entrepreneur and not had businesses fail, they probably inherited it or they're, they're not being completely honest. At least from my understanding, you have a pretty good hit rate, if anything. Like, that 30, you got two, well, 10 of them, 33% that are running with something. That is impressive, of course. Like, the 20, that's where the emphasis is. Where I agree with you. The You have to expect some failure. You have to expect a lot of your attempts to be failures. I have a small little business, and they were describing to a friend the other day. Um, they were asking me, oh, what's the difference between working full-time? And now you have this smaller business where you get to own a little bit more stuff. The way I was describing it was that when you do full-time, you generally the stuff you put out there is successful generally in the sense of you work with product managers you work with designers as an engineer you work with a lot of specs that help you you know succeed whenever you build something so you expect your stuff you put out there to succeed but when you go onto the other path of starting stuff starting business and having all this void you expect your stuff to maybe work one times out of 10 if not 20 right and you always face yourself with these failure these why is nobody using this or why did it come out like this and all that so i feel like that was a very big difference between the, and what you were describing just now to be like expect the failures learn to fail and learn to get back up and just go on to the next one and all of that so i really like your your approach of seeing this you know to that point i'll just add that um i have absolutely seen and from my opinion and my vantage point there is no possible way to be successful at any business if you don't have a passion for it um, so you got to find niches that you truly have a passion because you need to find that niche and you need to work harder and smarter than everybody else in that niche to succeed. And um, it's so uh, life's too short to not have fun. As an entrepreneur, you're going to work your butt off. Uh, you are not working nine to five. There's no such thing as weekends and holidays. Um, so you got to find what you have a passion about where your uh, working is, is part of who you are and you enjoy it. Once this episode comes out, all my followers are just going to quit their job and start a new business and it's all because... No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding on that. <laughs> I, I actually had a, a really great experience that I like to share. Um, but a week before my 30th birthday uh, was one of my big wins as an entrepreneur. And I had a very nice cash out. Um, and I semi-retired a week before my 30th birthday. And my kids were young before they were in school and we left for what was going to be an eight month vacation. Um, and after about a month and a half of that, I was going nuts. I couldn't take another pool or pina colada. I wasn't in an environment where I was solving challenges. My wife was like, honey, I love you, but you are not good at not having businesses to run. And I learned a valuable lesson that, um, I, um, this is part of who I am. And when I don't have this in my life, I'm losing a lot of who I am and I'm not fulfilled. I, I live in Scottsdale, Arizona now and I don't golf. So I, I um, which makes me rare, but so I, uh, although I, I love uh, outdoor activities, hiking, working out, walking the dogs, uh, I have found that I could never truly retire. I always have to have businesses going because it's part of what fuels me. And I've met many retired people who feel are, are, are not happy that they retired um, because they don't have that stimulation in their life. And I was fortunate to learn this at a young age. And that's a big driver of who I am and what I'm doing. And of all the ventures I've done, I am confident that I'm working on my grand slam right now which I've, I've, had a, I've had a bunch of homers, lots of doubles and triples, but I got into providing nearshore software development services because I saw a big need in the market that um, it's interesting how many companies out there have software engineering and development teams. It's not just um, IT companies or computer software companies. It's um, like, 70 plus percent of all companies out there um, at this point have some type of software engineering team. And the traditional model of getting additional help beyond the team that you have has always been to go offshore to places like India um, and certain Asian markets. And 
um, that was a great opportunity to have people working during the day, be able to pass stuff off to people who work at night. And then what happened was around 2014, 2015, as cloud environments have matured and gotten more complex as well as mobile environments, it's, we, we started to see the pattern that you couldn't have separate teams working at separate times because there's too many decisions to make. There's too much collaboration that's needed. And I saw that model be more and more ineffective. Um, I um, had companies where I owned uh, software development centers in various parts in offshore locations, such as the Philippines, such as in India. And I, I really started to experience it and there is a lot of areas that that type of offshore support is great. But for complex, modern software development, I saw this big need where you needed additional help that the nearshore market where you had people who are English speaking same time zone at a lower price point than you can do in the US was a big need. And when I started this in 2020, I typically had to educate people what nearshore meant. And as we're in 2024, most people who are uh, have some type of title within technology or software engineering are very familiar with Nearshore. And that was a big need I saw in the market that um, we've been focused on at Sonatify Technology. And we have had a phenomenal run and we're just getting started. Something that really stuck to me is start, run, operate. Or you may have said a couple more examples to those terms, but it's so powerful in the sense of start, run, and operate. So maybe even just the beginnings of Sonotify. Could you tell me a little bit more, even the name or even a bit of the background story of that? And then we go on from there just because a lot of that leads into your literal day-to-day today. So Sonotify, the name, a bit of the origin, what's behind that? When I started this company, I actually found an existing firm that had operations in Tijuana, Mexico that was owned by a founder in San Diego and two other founders in Hong Kong. And it was actually a Hong Kong based entity that owned it. And what had happened was the previous owners had multiple companies, had some very good exits. And this company was um, somewhat ignored and not fully utilized. And I found the opportunity where I met the partners, developed a great relationship and did a tuck-in acquisition of that existing firm in order to propel the efforts um, that I was doing. And that existing firm name was Sonata Services. And I was like, all right, I gotta modernize this name here. And I was like, Shopify, Spotify, Sonatify. And it was the blend of trying to uh, keep the existing culture while making it a more modern name. Now, most people can't pronounce it and they say Sonata Taffy. Uh, And it's it's pretty funny, but it gives us some character. Your approach to this one is that there has already been something running, but being able to add like a, like a wrapper to it to make sure that there's the correct operational bits to it and the correct structure to it and maybe more potential to, to dive into different things. I feel like that's such a unique story to your encounter with Sonata Services to begin with. Um, but also, even from back then, maybe you could help me out in terms of, I guess, who used Sonatify. Like, there's two parts to it, right? There's, like, the part of building tech for people, but there's also the part of needing this tech to begin with. So maybe as a perspective, from whether it's from back then or today, is, like, who uses Sonatify, just so that we know uh, what, kind of, what kind of demographic we're talking to. Sure. So we have clients across the board from... Um, early stage companies that are in series A, B, or C type funding rounds, which if your, your listeners aren't familiar with that, you kind of have startup companies that have seed rounds. And once they start to have a certain level of success, that's usually when they move to a series A, B, and C round. And we, uh, we have a large group of our companies that historically have been series A, B, C round type companies that are, um, focus on changing or revolutionizing existing industries. We do a lot in healthcare and life sciences companies where they're looking at better ways to, for medical professionals to be more efficient, to have medical records, um, be able to be processed more effectively. Um, The inefficiencies in the healthcare and life sciences arena are unbelievable just based on the way it's grown, based on security and compliance standards. And we see a lot of 
uh, clients in that space. We have a lot of clients in the fintech space from different types of lending aspects. Um, and we also have then clients just from multiple industries and companies large and small. We've had Fortune 500 clients uh, such as IBM, Cisco, um, Fox. Um, we've had um, well-known companies like TaylorMade Golf um, that we've done work for. We've had companies, and then to expand from that, we've had companies that have existing engineering teams that need more firepower to meet deadlines and demand that we work with their existing teams. We have companies that have no internal team and are looking for us to be their internal team. And uh, most of the projects we do are either greenfield projects where we're starting from scratch or we're modernizing existing platforms that clients have in order to be able to either put them in the cloud or have them operate more effectively. Um, and all of our engagements, we do focus around custom environments, meaning that we're working on modern frameworks. We, um, we don't customize existing um, software platforms such as um, Salesforce or Microsoft Dynamics or ERP systems. Now we will create hooks and APIs into those systems, but we're focused on um, custom platforms that clients want. And once again, with the, um, with the intent of differentiating the experience and making processes better. Is it always um, web versus mobile or versus like platform? Like I want, a, I want a iPad app. I want all these kind of app. Like is, do you guys specialize in one thing or is it just whatever people ask in a sense of, because I know that the world of technology is massive. Some people just want command line tools, for example, and you don't even need a UI for a lot of them. So maybe when you talk with these different opportunities, these different companies and these different people looking for ideas, like what, what, what is your expectation? What actually ends up being? Is it mostly just web or what did that look like? So, and great question. And a lot of what we see and what we do is we are building web-based applications, however, that need to be built in a manner so that they're mobile responsive, whether it's on a, uh, a phone, a tablet, or different size screens. Um, we also do um, native iOS and Android development, um, but a lot of our projects are companies that are building it um, for business processes, for making things more efficient, where it is that mix of the, the web and mobile-based functionality. No, that's absolutely fascinating. And one thing I could probably ask on top of that is those are great examples. The IBM, the Cisco's, the, the, the TaylorMade. One thing that pops into my mind is that they're very different companies. Some of them might be TaylorMade. Probably, if I'm not mistaken, in the golf world, they make clubs and they do a lot of hardware and tangible products as opposed to thinking about Cisco. And Cisco does a bit of hardware than I'm looking if I got that correctly. And also the IBM, there's a lot of fun software behind the scenes as well. But how do you gauge, I guess, like if you're able to do the project or not, I guess, just because of the, the product that they're selling is very different. Selling a golf club is very different than selling a data server. So when you receive these, um, I guess, requests, do you have any criteria, do you have any kind of like checklists or step points that you and your team, of course, go through to be like, can we do this? Can we not do this? Or maybe a couple examples of these checkpoints if you have. Uh, no, that, and that's a great question. And, you know, our typical client meeting is first talking about their project needs. Um, understanding what they're trying to accomplish, understanding their existing team in place, if any, understanding sometimes clients have specific technology stacks that they're requiring for one reason or another. Um, and then we look at what type of custom support they need. And we, um, we have technology stacks that we do not support that are largely legacy tech stacks or global. Uh, or COBOL. Uh, yes, we do not support COBOL. Um, and like I said, we don't customize existing platforms like Salesforce or ERP or Microsoft Dynamics. So throughout that process where we understand the project, the technology stacks, what they're looking for, that's where we're able to determine if it's truly a good fit for us. And I am always the first um, to be upfront and not take projects on that I am not confident we can succeed on. Um, and that's, a, you know, especially in the software development world, um, custom software development's hard. And it's not if you're gonna have problems, it's 
when you're going to have problems and there's always challenges to solve. And so from a company perspective, choosing the right products or projects to work on it is very important because one thing with software development, you're never done. You're always adding features and enhancements because the world around us is evolving so quickly and technology is evolving. Um, and so we look for clients that are truly looking for long-term relationships and where we make sure it's within our core competency. Well, I think that could kind of like dovetail a bit what you're seeing right now is the size and length of project. I don't need the exact details of how long your average project is, but how do you know a project is over, over in a sense of like sometimes in the contract, be like, oh, let's say it's a three year project, then it's like three years. But what happens to the support after? What happens to the maintenance after? What happens to that? So maybe from your, of course, experience of seeing so many different examples is how do you know a project is over and how do you make sure that it's over. Not not that you want it to be over. It's more in the sense of like what's the what's the agreement like, just so that you're efficient with your role and also the customer has an expectation to be like, we can't just keep on getting more services after maybe a certain while. So that's at least my perspective, because I've asked this question many times to many different people, and maybe you you are probably one of the better person to ask this question to. In the software world, there is this misconception that you can give a fixed price for a project based on where requirements are. And when we, um, and I say there is this misconception of that because I have never, ever in my career been involved in a project where whatever you have documented of what you think you want is actually what you do because it's always evolving. You always look at additional features or changing functionality and you learn things from the product side, from the business side and from the technology side as you go that will mold the project. And so we're typically structuring our contracts with clients. We're, we're typically not getting involved with projects that are shorter than a one year duration. Um, many times um, contracts are structured with milestones or other uh, parameters to ensure that um, all teams are aligned. And you know our goal in any project we do is to have extremely happy clients where um, they're always extending our contract beyond the initial term. No, that's a good way to look at it, right? Because I definitely do know software lives more than a year, two years, three years. Some software have been here for decades, if not, and that's kind of where you're like, oh, what happens to that? Well, at least that's what Perry asks a lot of times. What happens to the software after a certain while? So um, this part is actually super fun to think about. So when you talk to a lot of different companies and everything, maybe on a lower level, maybe for Perry to understand is, do you talk to account managers from the company? Do you talk to CEO of the company? Do you talk to the marketing side of the company? Do you talk to engineering leads of the company? Like who is the individual that usually, not you, but of course the projects uh, of your project lead? Who is this individual? Because I want to talk about them maybe a little bit later in terms of do they have tech backgrounds? Do they not have tech backgrounds? Like that's kind of where I'm going with this. So maybe from you, what is the typical person that you end up talking to with these kind of projects? Are they PMs? Are they marketing people, tech people? What does that look like? I would say in the beginning stages of an engagement, it's usually um, engineering and technology leaders from directors of software development to VP of software development and engineering to CIOs, CTOs, and to CEOs. Kind of depends on the size of the organization. Um, if it's a smaller organization, oftentimes it's always the CEO, CTO, COO. When it's larger corporations, it's often the director and VP of software engineering. Or, or, um, and so, and everywhere in between based on the size of the organization. And they're usually, their goal is to put these engagements together then to help their their teams or for us to fully act as their software team um, or to blend with their existing team in order to achieve goals together. Not that I'm saying it's surprising. It's just interesting because I know Eng people don't like talking to like not vendors, but like just outside parties of it. But the the way you're describing these that like there is the need and they have the context. Like Eng people, like the Eng leadership, the VPs and the directors, they know what they need to build. And of course, I think a lot of the equation is how much will it cost? Resources and time and everything. So that's why I came on saying that is a good way to look at it. Um, one thing that I'm actually interested in is that if they do end up having this partnership with Sonify, which a lot of people end up having this partnership, is how does the accountability work in a sense of like, we need this build? Of course, you guys have a very high SLA, I'm assuming, with a lot of great like quality products. But for a lot of eng leaders, they kind of want to have a maybe understanding of how it's being built and what's being built and how it integrates to it. So when there's this, I guess, partnership, 
what involvement do you see from these like engineers? Do they end up became becoming more of like a like a product manager or a project manager or like more like a CEO of a small company kind of thing? Like, what does that perspective look like when it happened? Great question. And the way we attack every engagement is we like to use responsibility matrixes. So basically, we're listing out every every function that's involved in the software development pro- process from product owners and project managers, scrum masters, through uh, front end and back end engineers, DevOps, QA, UI, UX. We like to detail everything and have a responsibilities matrix of is that the client performing those functions or is it Sonatify performing those functions? And if I were to line up every responsibilities matrix we have with uh, our current client base, they're all different. We have some we're playing one or two roles. We have others we're playing 100% of the roles and then everywhere in between. So that's how we start engagements to make sure there's alignment. And when it's within our control, we're big on agile processes. Um, and we're big on documenting um, everything in an agile fashion using JIRA and Confluence, running daily standups with the engineering team, doing bi-weekly sprints with the engineering and business team to ensure buy-in. And we, when you do that process, and there's a reason why agile is such a buzzword and why it's out there, is when you truly follow that process correctly, there's never surprises. You always know, and everybody's aligned each step of the way with good, bad, and the ugly. Um, Now, when we work with clients, we're always adapting to their processes. And for various reasons, sometimes people don't want to do a full agile process. um, And that doesn't make it bad or wrong. But um, you always, to be a, a, a partner and a vendor to companies, you gotta adapt to their processes and their culture. And so um, we're, we're big on making sure there are regular checkpoints. Account management is a big part of our service that I'm personally involved with, with other members of my team that we're doing regular checkpoints with clients. And depending on the client engagement and what they're doing, sometimes they're once a month, sometimes they're multiple times a month, sometimes they're quarterly. Um, and we're doing that to always have an executive checkpoint with the client to ensure from their vantage point, everything's are on track. We're bringing up issues we see on our side um, and vice versa. And I always tell clients, the purpose of this is to be proactive at solving challenges. And I, I tell them up front, anyone tells you they're not, there's not gonna be problems or challenges, they're lying or they don't know what they're doing because that's, this is the world and this is why software development is so valuable. As you know, because it's about your your solving challenges all the time. I like the part where it's like there's the people who know what they don't know, and there's also people who don't know what they don't know, and that's always like a big field that I love diving into because I jump between those categories very very often. Trust me, and um and of course the word agile I love to out there. We could spend another four hours talking only about agile, right? The whole sprint and all the kind of throw out your Gantt charts if you want, do whatever you need to. But those are always the fun thing to keep track of a project. I do want to double click real quickly on talent. When we talk about talent, I want to talk about like the talent that you get to work with on a, on a daily basis. Because of course, when you get these partnerships with people, you have to deliver, and to deliver it, you need the talent to deliver that. At the end. So maybe on a on a high level, in the sense of like number one is what kind of talent do you have? You maybe allude a little bit of front end, back end, but like what kind of I guess like how would you categorize your talent basically? Great question. And we only hire mid and senior level software engineers that are skilled in modern cloud and mobile tech stacks. And they also have to be fully bilingual um, as we're uh, most of our engineers are uh, located throughout Latin America. So now, as anyone in this space knows, hiring engineers is a very challenging process. And I joke, you do it wrong enough, long enough, you figure out how to do it right. And so with all of my companies, I I mentioned I'm always big on building custom software to maximize the process. And with Sonatify, we built our platform, which we call Nexus, which is our platform on how we qualify engineers throughout each step of the process to bring new members on our team. And this is from initial application to code tests, to cultural tests, to 
um, English proficiency test. And the way I look at any process is every time you make a mistake and you make a bad hire, how can we have the software minimize that same mistake occurring again? And so this is a software that um, is our operating platform on how we run our business. Uh, this is a platform we've spent millions of dollars building. Um, and I always like to tell clients, we are a software development company first and foremost. Um, and we're, we also partner with companies to help sell their software development challenges because there are companies out there in my space that are just recruiting companies. They're not actually software development companies, but they're recruiting and staffing companies uh, that aren't or don't have the competency in-house to solve complex challenges. And one of the, the neat things that we have done with our Nexus platform um, is we built a community of engineers throughout Latin America. We have a private LinkedIn group that's called our Nexus um, engineering group that we are approaching 12,000 members in this group. They're all engineers throughout Latin America that have English um, LinkedIn profiles. And all we do to this community is we educate them. Every time we have an engineer not get hired, our, our talent acquisition and marketing team creates videos and articles and blog posts of what they did wrong. For example, um, if uh, everything is done via video calls these days, if you don't have a good looking background where you live, uh, put up a virtual background so it's not distracting. Um, we'll push that tip out. Uh, a more intricate tip for Latin America engineers is, hey, look, when English is your second language and you get nervous, most people have the tendency to try to talk real fast and rush through it. We're like, you can't do that. You're a software engineer and clients are going to want to challenge how you think. So take a time out if you need to take a deep breath and make sure you fully answer the question. And we constantly are, are just giving tips like that through videos, through blog posts. And that's how we've cultivated this big community. We do not promote Sonatify. We do not promote come work for our company. All we do is give tips tricks on and basically where we see other engineers fail. And this has created a big following for us. Um, that is a key way how we find good engineers quickly and how we vet them through our process. Feedback is gold. Feedback is diamonds. Feedback is precious. And the fact that you kind of, you and your team, of course, knew that it is valuable in the sense of like giving feedback in any part of this loop is worth it. And with the great example of Nexus is something so refreshing to hear in a sense of people say, oh, well, we give feedback. But what does that mean? You kind of just describe how you guys are giving back. Um, if, did I get this correctly about Nexus was that it was built internally and then you kind of just like treat it as a SaaS and then expose it to other companies? Or did I mis misunderstand that part? Just is the, the business set behind my brain. And that's a great question. And we did, this platform was built to bridge the gap between how to hire engineers um, and how it could be done more efficiently. And we actually, um, I'm going to stall answering your direct question for a minute because we have another module where we get requirements from clients of what they're looking for. And what they're looking for is not always straightforward. And we're drilling into with clients, must have skills for the engineers, nice to have. What cultural and other business skills are important because making sure there's a right cultural fit is a key part. And we actually grade our engineers and we create a matching score that we call NCIS score, which is our, our Nexus um, competency score of how we believe when we present engineers, they match to clients' requirements. And we did build this SaaS platform with the intent that we may bring it to market for other companies, basically for uh, any company who's hiring software engineers. Um, many times, if it's a larger company, there's a big disconnect between HR and the software engineering teams. And HR needs to follow a certain process and they get frustrated and the engineering departments get frustrated. And this was built for us to solve that challenge internally. And, um, you know, it, it is something that we had the plan to bring to market. But as the technology environment has been going through an interesting 14, 15 months, 
in the market. We've just continued to develop for our internal use. And it's something I do envision bringing to market at some time. Um, but the main, uh, the main priority of that is just to help us run our operations more efficiently. When you guys do bring it to market, I'll take credit for it. Hey. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm just kidding. Of course, you had it on some some blueprint somewhere and some some whiteboard over there. But um, I don't want to miss this opportunity. Uh, me, Perry, any any software engineer, we talk numbers. We love geeking out a little bit numbers. Especially, I do a bit of engineering management as well, and I think a lot about the resources. Right, a team of six engineers in the Bay Area, a million dollars, right, something like that. But in terms of economics at the moment, of course, I don't need the exact numbers. But how do people, I guess, gauge between the Sonotify model of, is it, is it more economical or how does that work? What, what are the considerations of people when they have projects to, to be like, oh, is it going to be a fixed cost? Is it not going to be a fixed cost? Like, how does that work? Maybe from, from your perspective of the economics behind a project at Sonotify. Sure. So when, from a pricing, from a software engineer perspective, and, and let's talk senior level engineers, meaning they have uh, at least five to eight years plus experience. Um, still, the cheapest path to go is, is are in certain offshore markets where you can get a senior engineer for let's say thirty to forty dollars an hour. Um, and I would push that to say it, it goes even a little higher than that, especially if you want them to work U.S. business hours versus their time zone. You're going to push it higher than that. Um, so offshore, typically 30 to, you know, let's say $50 an hour, um, depending on the shift and the experience where nearshore engineers are typically going to be 50 to 75 an hour. They are more expensive as, um, it's the markets evolved and become very popular and there's been a lot of demand, but then compare that to us based talent where depending if you're hiring internally or externally, you're easily going to pay. 100 to 300 dollars an hour depending on the talent the location and what they're doing and so um there's there's definitely a cost savings from um from that perspective and you know a lot of clients quite frankly i don't think we have one client that hasn't had bad experiences with offshore relative to their environments and their engineering teams that they usually need to have that bad experience before they're ready to advance to nearshore resources because they are more expensive. Um, and once again, there are many places where I think offshore resources are a phenomenal thing, but this custom complex um, modern cloud and mobile environment where you need constant collaboration is the niche that we serve um, and where we really excel. And um, you know, the biggest complaint that um, we see from clients is who are dealing in our type of environments is, yes, offshore is the cheapest, but productivity level is at 30 to 50 percent of what a USFT productivity level would be. And that's how often I, th I see CTOs um, think about it, uh, CIOs, um, because they have to battle CFOs who CFOs. Yes will often take the stance of, look, you need this many members of your team, go make it work with $20 an hour resources. And if it doesn't work, it's your fault. And uh, experienced CIOs and CTOs know how to smack them over the head to say, look, it's not about the cost per hour. We got to look at it at the productivity per hour. And also the overall experience for our team and what we're looking to accomplish and um, so it's a complex game, especially in this environment where technology has been hit hard. We're still, unfortunately, in an environment where it's hard for businesses to get investment, to get, uh, to get any type of favorable lending. Um, so we're, there's been a tight squeeze in the software development markets. And typically, it's the more experienced CIOs, CTOs that have been burned. Um, with the lower cost resources um, and dealing with different time zones um, that are our typical clients. 
And also, I've been very fortunate, actually. I've worked with a team who are based out of Guadalajara, and there's some of the... Like, I know you guys listen to this show, but you guys based in Guadalajara in Mexico, like, you guys are incredible. I came on saying there are a bunch of software developers, a bunch of QA devs, there are a bunch of people, and incredible, incredible people. So I do understand the near shore, I guess, like, impact. I've personally only had good experience with it. One of the neat things with that is, you know, in the U.S., um, working from home... Um, was pretty normal in the tech industry, even before the pandemic, Um, where throughout the rest of the world, it wasn't the norm. And our our developers we have throughout Mexico and Latin America, pre-pandemic, they are used to having to commute one to three hours each way to and from work. And so we're talking round trip, that's two to six hours out of their day commuting where they can't be productive, where they're away from their families. And I have never met a more grateful group of engineers who enjoy the working from home experience, who are more productive, who get more time with their family, who get more personal time. I've never dealt with more grateful people in my life of the opportunity it is with them because they didn't have that before, where I think in the U.S. we take that for granted um, because we've been doing it long before the pandemic in the tech industry. And so it's really cool when you you can help somebody make a great living, have them be ultra productive for the company, for your clients, and hear them say how their work-life balance is so much better. Now, with that said, all of us go stir crazy working from home too much. And so we really work hard to try to make that experience enjoyable and not make people feel isolated um, in their caves, staring at screens for 10 to 12 hours a day. Um, but it's really neat to see the, uh, the appreciation from our engineers of being in this type of environment. Um, and also the fact that, you know, they're making more money working with U.S. companies, maximizing their income. And so it, it's really fun to be a part of that. I think from from an engineer's perspective, the, the POV is always like, I want to work on something interesting. So you got to hold your end, Steve, of giving them very interesting projects. No that, doubt. That's usually how I think about it. Continuing Absolutely. education, working on cutting edge projects is a key part of my job to ensure we have happy and fulfilled engineers. I will ask this unsexy question. Perry does this once in a while, but in terms of, I guess, like coming from startup or working on different startups, it's always about funding, right? Funding, funding, funding. How do you get a project going, everything? So maybe from what you could share about Sonata at the moment, you, as far as I know, didn't raise, if not any, funding for the project. So, I mean, of course, there was that, uh, the acquisition that you're talking about, but maybe just in general, like the life cycle of like what is your take on the funding? I'll make the comment that throughout all of my ventures, um, I have raised hundreds of millions of dollars for my company. Um, And raising money for any venture is an enormous amount of work, whether, um, and surprisingly, if you're not familiar with that world, but raising large amounts is actually easier than raising small amounts because you're attracting a different type of investor. Um, And, So there is always an enormous amount of work and responsibility in order to do that. And we were fortunate that my background, based on the existing company that I purchased, we haven't had the need for external uh, investors and funding in a traditional sense. Um, But we do have a lot of clients that come to us who are pre-funding, who have an idea for a software platform and ask my advice of the best way to go about it. And what I'm always telling those entrepreneurs out there is that you need to build your initial proof of concept as quickly and cheaply as possible. And I try to tell people, look at no code, low code environments to do this. Look at any way you can, sometimes um, having a good Figma, um, UI UX layout, where, which is a, a, a visual design platform for listeners who don't know what that is, where uh, a UI UX designer can lay out screens and actually create a demo of functionality. I always tell people you want to do it as cheaply as possible because for you to go to investors to get them to raise money in what you're doing, you need to show them. You, they need to be able to visualize it. And you need to have your plan of attack in place. And I've always admired, um, and as an entrepreneur, the show Shark Tank, 
And I've always, as a guy who's been a serial entrepreneur, who has bought dozens of other companies, who um, have raised money for my ventures, have invested in other ventures, uh, I've always been very much like the shark mentality of what about this? What about this? You got to know your numbers. You got to have your plans. And so I'm always telling entrepreneurs like, you know, when you're going to raise money, when you're going to do this, if it's, if you're building a SaaS product, get your proof of concept as cheaply as possible done. And that's not through Sonotify. That's not what we specialize in. Um, and we'll often refer them to places that can help them do that. Um, and, you know, with that said, your business plan needs to be sound. I'm like, go watch Shark Tank if you need to. I'm like, get your pitch together and come pitch it to me and let me poke holes in it and talk to you as I've been an investor in numerous other companies that, and let me poke holes in it, make sure you're prepared. And um, I, I've had some very good mentors throughout my entrepreneurial career. And one of my mentors made a deal with me that, I, um, he would mentor me for free with the condition that I always agree to mentor other people and I'm never allowed to charge for it. And, um, with that said, I have many different people I mentor, but, and I though although I never charge money for it, I do put responsibility on them. And when I mentor people, they have homework, they have, a, there is a structure to it. And um, I'll never charge people, but if they can't follow through with their commitments, I'm not going to spend the time with them. This giving back approach, it's, it's infinitely impactful, infinitely positively impactful. Um, this idea that I'm throwing, I'm sure you guys have it on your whiteboard, but maybe investment branch of Sonotify or maybe like an incubator branch of Sonotify might pop up at some point in terms of, hey, that's a great idea. We'll give you 500k and we'll build it for you and help you run it. That's a, and I understand where, where that's coming from. That's a challenging play um, because there is so much that it takes to be successful. Um, and I don't know of many companies that have made that type of model work where they to, truly blend both. Um, I, with that said, um, you never know what the future entails. Um, and, um, I love helping entrepreneurs and I love helping companies solve complex engineering challenges. So who knows? Um, but still, we spoke about Sonatify so much. I want to come back just real quickly to Steve. Steve, um, what technologies do you use day to day that helps you run your life? What apps, what's your top favorite apps or what's the app on your computer that you use with Google Docs or anything like that? Like, could you just, you know, share top three, maybe most used applications or most favorite applications in, in your day today? So I will tell you that myself and my entire team are huge proponents of ChatGPT for solving issues. Now, uh, there, there gets to be some challenges for actual development and how you use ChatGPT because you don't want to put code out there because that then becomes public domain. But from everything from ideas to better crafting emails to um, productivity, uh, we are avid ChatGPT users to help us be productive. With that said, we, uh, we are a Google Workplace shop um, with all of Google Workspace applications. Uh, we are um, our Nexus software. Everybody in our company lives and breathes. Um, because that's our operating system for our talent side of the business. We're also HubSpot CRM users, um, and we're avid on LinkedIn. Um, those are uh, some of the uh, top ones that come to mind. And um, we're, then we're big on other productivity type tools to make sure every meeting has a good agenda, that there's good systems for everybody to make sure to follow up. Um, and it's never ending in the improvement of that. No, absolutely. I'm glad you shared it because, of course, everybody, every company does it differently. Some people use Slack, some people use Teams, some people use other things. So We are big Slack users as well, which uh, I'm a huge proponent of. And we like it when our clients are Slack users because what a great way to get quick answers and to engage with the team. And 
I never meant to start this war, but at some point I compared Slack as the blue bubbles, and I compared Teams as the green bubbles, and somehow that kind of degenerated a little bit. So anyways, thanks for sharing a lot of those technologies. I just want to ask this last question that I am absolutely fascinated with is, you had a radio show question mark? Well, once again, you keep aging me. Uh, but yes, I, uh, for many years... Uh, throughout the Arizona and California markets, I hosted radio shows around entrepreneurship, real estate investing, um, dealing with financial challenges, um, and I uh, have hosted numerous different radio shows, once again, throughout Arizona and California. This was before the podcast world, and I found it, it was a good forum to have guests, to um to truly identify myself as a subject matter expert uh, and had a lot of fun doing it. Um, and I always laugh um, and I heard Howard Stern say once that how he hated radio, even though he's been one of the biggest radio show hosts of all time, because he, he goes, it's like you have homework every single day um, of your topics and preparing for the next day's show. And um, as you know, we've done prep sessions for this podcast, I'm certainly preaching to the choir as you live and breathe uh, a leader in the podcast world. I mean, it's a lot of work to do what you're doing. And so I have a lot of respect for it. And although I have informally um, started my own podcast or a Sonify podcast, I've had a lot of fun being a guest on great ones like yours, Perry. Thank you, first of all. But second part, I agree in the sense of it's not work for me just because I get to talk to people like you, like all the previous guests and everything. It's my learning session. It's Perry's learning session and everything you've shared today is absolutely fantastic. So many good stories. I've laughed probably too much that I should today. But this is the part where I ask for the people who are builders, who want to do stuff, going back to this really strong keyword of start, run, operate and keep on doing it. What is your advice, whether they're straight out of college or they're in college or they're 10 years deep in their professional career? You've done it a couple of times. You know the hardships to it. You know the upside to it. What is your advice for the builders out there today? Probably two things come to mind. One is make sure you focus on what you truly have a passion in because it's hard to succeed as an entrepreneur if you don't. And then secondly, find good mentors in your space. Find others that have accomplished what you're trying to do. And when you approach successful people in the right manner, I know very few successful people who don't love helping others. Uh, usually it's the ones that inherited it that don't have an appreciation for um, the grit and the grind it takes. Sometimes they're not always as approachable, but the ones who have rolled their sleeves up to get it done, when you approach them in the right way, that you've done your research and you show you're eager to learn in an area, it's a great way to find great mentors. And, you know, you don't, um, this isn't as much of a uh, relevant today, but 20 years ago, um, you had the concept of McDonald's and Burger King. And McDonald's, and although both are still around, McDonald's has always been the innovator, trying everything first. And Burger King always just sat there and watched McDonald's and would only copy what worked. And they were they were always never the leader. They were always second, but they'd let McDonald's innovate what works, what doesn't, and then copy what works. And I always tell people, you don't have to be the McDonald's out there. Uh, you could be the Burger King and just copy what the McDonald's does. So that's probably the most advice I have for people out there on, uh, on how to be successful at your chosen area. Those are absolutely great advice. And the fortunate part for, for listeners and anybody is that you weren't kidding about being an author and sharing a lot of great content online. You have absolutely great following LinkedIn, Twitter, Medium. Medium is the one that surprised a lot of people. It's, it's so good to be a good publisher on Medium uh, with the content that you have. So where could people follow you? What is the best venue to follow? See what else was the best venue to follow Sonotify? Our website is www.sonotify.com. Also, we're big on LinkedIn. Uh, I also write for Forbes and Entrepreneur magazine and have articles published monthly. Um, we publish all of those on our Sonotify blog. Um, and follow me personally on LinkedIn. Uh, follow the company Sonotify. Reach out to us. We'd love to chat with you, whether it's a brainstorm or whether it's helping you with projects or whether it's something in between. 
No, absolutely. And of course, all the links will be shared in the show notes down below, so you can check it out over there. But And if you ever do find any clips of your old recordings for your radio show, if you send it over, I will link them. I will <laughs> back, I'll link them as well, so it's up to you at the end. But either way, Steve, this has been a great conversation. I just want to thank you again for being on the show. This has been a lot of fun, Perry. Thank you. And uh, I hope your listeners enjoy this show. And uh, I know I had fun. That's so great to hear. Well, either way, thanks guys so much, and I will catch you guys on the next one. And that was Steve Taplin, CEO of Sonotify. All the links are shared in the description notes below. Go check them out. If you would like to be on Podcast Room by Software Engineer, reach out to us. Just email contact at parentsu.com. Can't wait to have you on the show. Once again, thank you so much for listening to Podcast Room by Software Engineer. Don't forget to hit the follow button on your podcast app and leave us a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It's completely free. And if you want to tell your friends about Podcast Room by Software Engineer, that's totally cool as well. Anyways, I am Parrot to you and I'll catch you on the next one. Big love. <laughs>